Good morning. It's, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, be here. Uh, the last time I was here, I was uh, sharing earlier, was when my wife was in the ICU for seven or eight days for uh, streptococcal pneumonia. You, everybody took great care of her, so I have uh, good memories of uh, the suburban hospital. I'm going to talk about the genetics and genomics of thyroid neoplasm and uh, some of the changes that have occurred that uh, I think, uh, uh, as I understand most of you are physicians in practice, uh, should know. So first I'll uh, review the uh, epidemiology of thyroid cancer that has uh, significantly changed and what that means, uh, and then go over the genetic uh, changes that lead to thyroid cancer initiation and progression and then uh, finish off by uh, discussing the application of this uh, new knowledge. Since I understand most of you are clinicians, I, I thought I'd make my presentation uh, sort of case-based and not too many pathways. So I have uh, two patients I'm going to share with you, both of which took care of or taken care of. One was a patient I took care of when I was in San Francisco, a 55-year-old woman who uh, presented with an eight-year uh, history of a neck mass. Uh, as you can see, her ultrasound of the thyroid is really unimpressive. You've got this uh, almost one centimeter hypoechoic thyroid nodule. So she got it biopsied and it was inconclusive. Uh, unfortunately for her, she didn't really have uh, adequate or proper follow-up, you could say, and presented with advanced uh, lymph node metastasis, as you could see in the image down below. And uh, the patient on the, your left-hand side is a 63-year-old patient with a pretty significant family history of uh, thyroid cancer, two of her daughters and her son, and uh, had a screening ultrasound that identified a thyroid nodule. But I'm not going to, she had a biopsy of the thyroid nodule, which showed atypical cells. I'm going to stop with that case because this is a patient we just recently saw in January and uh, use these two cases uh, to really emphasize how things have changed. Anyways, the 55-year-old woman went on to have a thyroidectomy. You see her specimen. This is the internal jugular vein, very bulky advanced disease. Unfortunately for her, because of the delay in diagnosis, she ended up with stage three thyroid cancer. Probably doesn't project well here, but you could see the overall survival is not nearly as good as stage one disease. So perhaps a delay in diagnosis uh, due to the limitations of the biopsy uh, cytologic examination. So uh, for those of you not familiar with thyroid cancer, it's actually one of the 10 most common thyroid cancers and five, fifth most common in women. And uh, it is expected that we'll have over 60,000 thyroid cancer uh, diagnosis this year. What has been surprising though is, as you could see in the figure that I borrowed from an article by McLeod in The Lancet, in almost every continent that you see in Europe, Italy, the Asia, Australia, New Zealand, the incidence rate has almost doubled or tripled in some countries. And this may be due to incidentally detected thyroid nodules, but I'll go into that a little bit more and maybe discuss some possibilities for this. Obviously, the most common thyroid cancer is papillary thyroid cancer. It accounts for 80% or more than 80% of cases, and less common are follicular thyroid cancer. I just have that table up there just to remind you when I discuss the genetics. I'm primarily going to be focusing on the common type of thyroid cancer of follicular cell origin. So the Epidemiology of thyroid nodules have also changed. Many patients are diagnosed with a thyroid nodule subclinically, either on screening ultrasound for occlusive carotid disease, as you can see on the top image of the ultrasound here, a subcentimeter thyroid nodule that ended up being thyroid cancer, or with the increased use of functional imaging studies, for example, a PET scan. Initially, to stage a patient with colon cancer might detect the thyroid nodule or during follow-up. 
The prevalence then of thyroid nodules, we used to say, is about 3 to 4 percent on palpation. But now, with the increasing use of imaging studies, it's actually upwards of 50 percent for people that are 50 years of age and older. And actually, when you have a family history, that patient that I shared with you, the 63-year-old woman, the rate of thyroid nodules is they present 10 years younger with 10 percent higher prevalence of thyroid nodules. Why is this important? Well, the rate and increase in thyroid cancer relative to the patients that have a thyroid nodule is much more dramatic. And about one-third of these patients here in the green line are going to end up having a thyroid nodule biopsy that's inconclusive. So this represents significant health care expenditure and actually accounts for nearly 150 to 175,000 thyroidectomies being done in the U.S. completely to exclude a thyroid cancer diagnosis. So why has the incidence of thyroid cancer increased? There's a nice paper, uh, analysis of this uh, using the NCI SEER database by Davis and Welch, and they looked at exactly what types of thyroid cancer were increasing. No surprise, the most common type of thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, accounted for most of this increase. What was perhaps most surprising is the fact that most of these cancers were less than two centimeters. Eighty percent of the increase was accounted for cancers that were less than two centimeters. So based on their analysis, they thought the increase was likely due to diagnostic scrutiny, thyroid incidentalomas or overdiagnosis. But using the same data set three years later, Amy Chan and colleagues at Emory then looked at this data. They show that the increase was actually more dramatic in women, but there was also a small but real increase in thyroid cancer-related mortality, mostly in men. When they looked at the age groups in which it increased, as you could see, those that were older than 45 were the ones that had higher even rates of thyroid cancer, which suggests that this is actually a, a real increase in disease burden. And then they went on to look at the thyroid tumor size and found that even those that are larger than four centimeter were also increasing. So they suggested that this could not be just diagnostic scrutiny and there must be something else. Well, the environment has a lot of carcinogens. Uh, radiation exposure, uh, external beam that was used for therapy in the 50s and 60s, a known established risk factor for thyroid cancer, but we don't use it anymore. So the other radiation exposure is the Chernobyl meltdown, and uh, we've learned uh, important lessons from that. Yes, the rate of thyroid cancer increased in Eastern Europe, predominantly in children and adolescents, and that latency period was much shorter. It used to be 20, 30 years, but in those cohorts it was actually 8 to 10 years. We don't know what the result of the exposure from uh, Fukushima related to the earthquake in Japan could entail, but certainly ionized radiation and fallouts have not happened worldwide where that really could account for this increased incidence of thyroid cancer. We were puzzled by this and looked at the genetic landscape uh, or changes that are common in thyroid cancer over a 15-year period from 1991 to 2015, and we looked at BRAF mutations, RAS mutations, RET-PTC rearrangements, we'll all go into detail later on, and what was surprising to us is the rates went from 68 percent to almost 92 percent of the tumors, that is, of patients diagnosed in 2000 to 2005 had somatic mutations, specifically the rate of BRAF mutation had also increased. The group at Pittsburgh also followed up this uh, result or the study and did their own analysis, and they primarily focused on a histologic subtype of papillary thyroid cancer follicular variant, and they also found RAS mutations were fairly more common in the later time period. 
So I think this data tells us that this increase in incidence is multifactorial. It certainly can't just be diagnostic scrutiny, it might be environmental, and that there is a genetic basis for this increased incidence, and that probably represents a, a real increase in disease burden. Lastly, it is the fastest growing cancer diagnosis in the U.S., but I also want to point out Although it's a small increase in mortality that's been observed, it's only one of three cancers for which overall mortality has actually increased. So then the question becomes, who dies of this disease? Well, thyroid cancer is really one of the few cancers that has a staging system with the age in it. And as you can see from this figure, basically if you're older than 45, your risk of dying from thyroid cancer is higher. Now I'm going to start sharing some genetic data uh, with you. Uh, we've been fortunate to be part of the working group of the Cancer Genome Atlas in focused on papillary thyroid cancer. And uh, this data is not published uh, yet. But what I have is a figure of whole exome sequencing of the tumor samples. And on your y-axis is the number of non-silent mutations. This is an over, this is an almost in 500 tumor samples. What's intriguing is older patients with papillary thyroid cancer in their primary tumor have a greater number of non-silent mutations. So the higher mortality rate that we see might actually be related to this. And I'll also talk about the implications of BRAF and uh, more aggressive thyroid cancer later on. So what about the genetics of thyroid cancer? This is just a very brief review of a working uh, multi-step uh, progression model that most people have accepted. You have a normal follicular thyroid cell here, the most common type of thyroid cancer, abbreviated here PTC, is papillary thyroid cancer. And there are three distinct mutations that lead to thyroid cancer initiation. A BRAF mutation, RAS mutations, which are most commonly the KRAS mutation, and then RET PTC rearrangements. These occur in about three-fourths of papillary thyroid cancer. We think it's an early event because you could detect these mutations in very small, occult, papillary thyroid cancer. The second most common type of thyroid cancer, follicular thyroid cancer, has a slightly different genetic profile. RAS mutations have a much higher prevalence. And then PAX8 PPR gamma rearrangement is another common uh, genetic alteration in this tumor. What's intriguing is, though, usually, there's a follicular adenoma which is thought to be pre-malignant that progresses to follicular thyroid cancer. And this is based on the follicular thyroid cancers having higher RAS mutation rates or PAX, PPR, gamma rearrangements. And then I won't cover Herthel cell carcinoma, which some people think is very similar to follicular thyroid cancer. So, but these mutations don't only occur in thyroid cancer. There's only two that are exclusively present in thyroid cancer. And this is the BRAF mutation and the RET PTC rearrangement. And when I discuss molecular testing for diagnosis in biopsy samples of thyroid nodule, this will be important in looking at the data. So how do these mutations, the common mutation, RET, PTC, RAS, and BRAF, cause thyroid cancer. All of these mutations act on the MAP kinase pathway, the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. So for example, the RET PTC is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase receptor. However, when you have the rearrangement, it's constitutively activated. It does not need a ligand to bind it to signal downstream. Similarly, if you have a RAS mutation, you also have activation of this pathway. And then, as I mentioned, the BRAF mutation, which also lead to 
increased activation of this pathway, all of which lead to thyroid cancer initiation and progression. There have been nice uh, transgenic mouse models demonstrating these three mutations uh, are involved in initiation and progression of thyroid cancer. So to go back to the 63-year-old woman with a strong family history of thyroid cancer who had a biopsy showing atypical cells, I said stop because we're evaluating her here uh, in this era now that we have this information. So how are we going to use this information, uh, the genetics of thyroid cancer? I have a, ba a very basic uh, diagram up patient with a thyroid nodule, uh, FNA stands for fine needle aspiration biopsy. Fortunately, 80% of these biopsies are going to be interpreted benign, and the false negative rate for that is less than 65%. Very reliable test in that category. Less than 10% will also be malignant. About a third, though, will be inconclusive, and that's not because the cytopathologists are not good. It's just the cells of a malignant tumor and a benign tumor look very much the same, that you need to see capsular invasion or angio invasion to determine whether it's malignant or not, and that's why so many people need a diagnostic uh, thyroidectomy. The risk of cancer is anywhere from 5 to 50 percent, really no better than a, a coin toss. So this is a group of patients that I spend a lot of time discussing, removing half of the thyroid gland and then saying, well, if it ends up being cancer, then we would need to remove the other half of the thyroid gland. To emphasize how a significant problem this is, I just have 10 studies, it's sort of a meta review of the data from 10 different institutions, over eight thousand thyroid biopsy results. And as you could see, on the y-axis is the risk of malignancy, on the x-axis is the different categories of cytologic diagnosis by, based on the thyroid nodule biopsy result. Well, you see there's fairly good agreement when it's benign and when it's malignant. This is across multiple institutions. What is alarming, though, is let's say what's considered a non-diagnostic sample at some institutions ends up being cancer only in 5 percent, but at other institutions it ends up being cancer in 50 percent of the cases. And this follows for the other cytologic groups, follicular neoplasm, and even when it's suspicious for cancer, you could see it's not really uniform risk of malignancy anywhere from a little over 40 percent to over 80 percent. So it's certainly a limitation, and this is why the NCI Bethesda classification system was established, so that we are all speaking the same language when you look at these biopsy results. But again, you see the inconclusive categories, even with this established classification, if a patient has atypia, their risk of cancer is anywhere from 5 to 15 percent. If it's a follicular neoplasm, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. And these patients need an operation just for the sole purpose of a diagnosis. So this brings up how are we going to, is there any data supporting using genomics and genetics to make the diagnosis? There's been, the literature has been replete with multiple studies identifying multiple markers for thyroid cancer diagnosis. Fortunately, we're at the point where there's actually two commercial assays. I won't necessarily talk about the commercial assays, but rather the data that others and we have generated that have led to these commercial assays being developed. And two of them have been deemed FDA uh, approved. Uh, we really don't know the cost benefit of using these uh, assays in practice, however, yet. So, I went through and described the common genetic changes that occur in thyroid cancer, and there have been studies, including ours, that have looked at a panel of these in 110 indeterminate or inconclusive thyroid nodule biopsies. I'm just using the review article by Pashkin colleagues that looked at the four largest studies. And that did the mutation testing in clinical thyroid nodule biopsy samples. 
as you could see, the specificity is fantastic. 98 to 100%. What is limiting is the sensitivity, the number of times it's positive in a patient with the disease. And in our study, it was as low as 38% and as high as in 86% in the Italian group study. So what was important though is that you don't just do your somatic uh, mutation testing for one gene, but rather do the panel of uh, genes, and this clearly shows you that your sensitivity improves in that scenario. So this didn't really become or available until the study out of uh, the University of Pittsburgh looking at this in over 900 clinical thyroid FNA samples. And I th I'm sharing this data with you because I think this is one of the better studies that really crystallizes the impact in uh, patient management. So this is a table I followed from that paper. And you have the three groups that are somewhat of a clinical dilemma in, pe in pe pill that see patients with thyroid nodule. You get a biopsy result that's atypical or AUS, or it's a follicular neoplasm, so you can't say it's benign or malignant on cytology, or it's suspicious for cancer. But if you look at using cytology only versus if you look at these panel of mutations, the RAS mutations uh, detected were both HRAS, KRAS, and NRAS, the risk of malignancy if the nodule was negative for any of these mutations for each of those three categories is almost down in half. So based on this, primarily for those biopsy results that are atypical or follicular neoplasm, if it's positive, the patient can have one definitive treatment and doesn't need multiple operations. So if it's positive, it's great because it makes a significant impact in the management of this patient. The problem is the sensitivity is fairly low. So how could we improve the sensitivity? Are there more mutations in thyroid cancer that are just not detected? This is a nice uh, analysis of uh, whole exome sequencing uh, data. It's in over 3,000 tumor samples compared to their counterpart normal thyroid tissue in this case as well. And as you can see on the y-axis is the number of uh, somatic mutations and then on the x-axis are the different cancers. Well, you see thyroid cancer there has a fairly low mutation rate compared to melanoma, lung cancer, and bladder cancers, which are much more aggressive. This is again data from the Cancer Genome Atlas project, and I share this with you because the previous analysis would suggest that it's a fairly low frequency mutation event that is in thyroid cancer, but when you look at not only point mutations, but gene fusions, or when you look at single copy number amplifications of genes, or focal deletions in genes, you could actually, in nine, nearly 95% of thyroid cancer samples, detect any one of these mutations or genetic alterations. So it's not far-fetched with the advancing technology of next-generation sequencing that one could develop an assay that specifically looks at a panel of these mutations which would allow the sensitivity of molecular testing and thyroid nodule biopsies improve tremendously. The next area that has been developed into a commercial assay is genome-wide expression profiling. I just have four studies up there that identified anywhere from a three-gene signature to over 600-gene signature, primarily looking at the thyroid nodules that are difficult to diagnose on biopsy. And this is just a heat map. And as you could see, you don't have to be a molecular biologist or a bioinformatician. You could tell there's pretty good separation of the benign tumors from the malignant tumors. So this is nearly 10 years ago. And it was great promising accuracy Overall accuracy of 100%, greater than 90% sensitivity and specificity, 
But it wasn't until this large study that first we could even find out whether genome-wide expression analysis could be done in clinical biopsy samples. This is a large study, both academic and community hospitals, 49 clinical centers. And they looked at over 4,800 thyroid nodules. Unfortunately, though, only a little over 400 of those were the inconclusive type. So much of the data I share with you is in 265 of those patients that ended up having an operation. So 85 of those patients ended up having thyroid cancer. Now, this was a promising assay. You look at the sensitivity, it's 95 percent, I think, or rather 92 percent, which is, I think, acceptable. However, the specificity is low. And when you look at the categories in which this analysis would be most helpful would be the atypia of undetermined significance with a negative predictive value. That is, when it says it's negative, it's negative 95 percent of the time. So this ended up being an assay that tells us, oh, this thyroid nodule is likely to be not cancerous. Doesn't really help you tell you whether it is cancerous. But I think it's also informative to look at the study a little bit more closely because when you look at the benign samples, it's really almost split down the middle. It's only in 50 percent of the cases that it ended up saying that it was benign for a benign tumor. So that's not really helpful. And then lastly, there were some false negatives. So seven patients that were, would have been classified as not having cancer, and one of which ended up having a fairly aggressive type of thyroid cancer. So there are limitations to this assay. So where are we with diagnostic markers and application of genetics and genomics? Clearly, I have a curve here. Let's say this is the benign thyroid nodules and these are the malignant, the inconclusive being that sort of overlapping area. We have great molecular testing to detect mutations and tell us if it's positive, it's cancer. And then we have a reasonably good gene expression classifier analysis that tells us half of the thyroid nodules that are not cancerous are not cancerous with that inconclusive result. So <clears throat> what we need is additional genomic analysis, and I think the data that's going to be coming from the Cancer Genome Atlas project, which we're looking at both the methylation of genes, the microRNA, both of which are very important in gene expression regulation as well as the <clears throat> copy number analysis. But I would like to share with you some of the work we've done. Uh, we've sort of done our own integrated analysis. We looked at uh, the methylome of thyroid cancer and uh, follicular variant of thyroid cancer, which is very particularly difficult to diagnose, and compared it to normal thyroid tissue. So some of you might not be familiar with uh, methylation. It's essentially methylation at the CPG nucleotide. Usually it resides in the promoter region of a gene. So if that region is methylated or hypermethylated, it generally silences a gene and vice versa. In some cases, if the methylation is low or hypomethylated, it might turn on a gene. And it's been implicated in carcinogenesis. So it made great sense to look at it and we looked at over a half, a, almost a half a million CPG sites. And this is a principal component analysis, and I don't know if it projects well enough for you to see, but you could see the red samples are those follicular variants that are sometimes difficult to diagnose, I shared with you, and the green are papillary thyroid cancers. And you could see they cluster fairly well together, and in blue you have the normal samples. But some of the follicular variants are all over the place. We then asked, well, we're interested in finding out the ones that are mutation negative because you could test for the somatic mutation in the tumor sample or in the biopsy sample and tell if it's cancer, but if it's mutation negative, 
Are you able to distinguish it or classify it as a malignant lesion? And this is a heat map that shows a comparison between here normal and these are wild type tumors. These are tumors without BRAF mutation, RAS mutations, or RET-PTC rearrangements. And these are ones with BRAF mutations or RAS mutations. And their methylome, or they're distinctly different from normal, pretty much at similar sites, which suggests that selecting some CPG sites and doing a methylation analysis for specific genes might be helpful in distinguishing these types of tumor. Then the last part of my talk is going to focus on prognosis. Um, and thyroid cancer is one of those cancers that has a fairly good prognosis. It's only 10 to 15 percent of patients that have aggressive disease. And there's been almost a cottage industry of better stratifying it because you want to identify that 10 or 15 percent and treat those patients aggressively, but yet treat the other patients not aggressively. So do less invasive operation, remove less lymph nodes, not give them radioiodine if they don't need it. And I just have a table here, as you could see, over eight different clinical and pathologic classification system, all based on clinical information or available or pathology. And they all work great. This is a study comparing all of these classification systems, including the TNN staging system, which is what's commonly used. And they predict overall outcome terrific. Here's the low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, the TNM staging system, the AIMS classification system. What's striking, though, is the stage one patients, that's about 80 percent of all patients, they have essentially near normal life expectancy 20 years out. So are we treating the 80 percent of patients like the patients with stage two, which has a markedly different overall prognosis? The stage three and four we know are advanced disease. So how could we better identify these patients that are going to have aggressive cancers and that warrant more aggressive uh, treatment. So people have looked at the somatic mutations and evaluated whether the presence of this mutation is associated with more aggressive thyroid cancer. And this was the first study by Ming Zhao Zing from Johns Hopkins that looked at this. And as you could see in the disease-free survival curve here, those that were, had tumors that were the BRAF mutant, the most common type, the V600E, had a worse disease-free survival. This study, though, was criticized for not being a, a multivariate analysis and the follow-up was not inadequate. And they also included more aggressive types of thyroid cancer that perhaps influenced this result. So we looked at this question specifically in patients with just garden variety conventional papillary thyroid cancer for which most patients do well from. The presence of the mutation was associated with older age, also with higher rates of lymph node metastasis and distant metastasis, and not surprisingly, they also had a higher stage of cancer. What was most probably compelling to us regarding this association was when you look at those patients that had stage one papillary thyroid cancer, mind you, that's the group that has a near normal life expectancy over 20 years, the rate of recurrence, depending upon what system you used, TNM staging or the risk stratification system, the risk of recurrence was anywhere from two to three times higher in those with BRAF mutations. I have a question in the audience. Go right ahead. Yes, please. Um, you're, you're basing most of your information on one thyroid biopsy. Uh, it, in people with multiple thyroid biopsies, do these genetic uh, mutations uh, stay? Because I, my understanding is that genetic mutations can come and go. 
Yeah, so, uh, well, I think the question you're asking is, is thyroid cancer monoclonal or polyclonal? No. Is okay. Is genetic predisposition to thyroid cancer mm -hmm. through genetic uh, mutations uh, a finite thing, or is it something that um, changes uh, biopsy to biopsy? No, no, so these are driver mutations. Uh, obviously, in a tumor, the cell population is relatively heterogeneous, but these are driver mutations. So people have done analysis and microdissecting, and even in multicentric papillary thyroid cancer, the rate of positive is fairly high. So you're not going to lose, or it's not going to be a genetic drift, so to speak, in the tumor itself, unless it's acquiring an additional mutation. So we, we believe this data speaks to, you know, if it's biopsy positive, it's going to behave this way. It's not going to lose the uh, mutant uh, BRAF. So more recently, in over 1,800 patients, this data has been confirmed, and this is a study across uh, three continents and looking at BRAF positive and negative thyroid cancer. On the curve you see here, this is overall survival. I already told you it's a relatively not aggressive type of thyroid cancer. There is a real but small difference in overall survival in patients with BRAF mutant tumors as compared to negative tumors. And when you look at the less aggressive type, the conventional papillary thyroid cancer, you also see this difference. What's the problem with this? This is great. It's one of the few examples that you could do a genetic test, a single gene, predict prognosis. There are some gene express, expression profiling analysis for breast cancer. You could do a similar thing, but this, this is pretty remarkable for thyroid cancer because it's a low death event. What the problem is, is I have in a box down below. It's the rate, the number of thyroid cancers that are positive for this mutation. It's nearly 50%. So this would mean you would have to overtreat 9 out of 10 patients with a BRAF mutation to possibly benefit that one patient that has a BRAF mutant sample. So this is really the major shortcoming of this. So we have been trying to look beyond BRAF because we recognize the limitation is that it's too prevalent of an assay. And I'm going to just share with you unpublished work that we have submitted. And we looked into this. This is all work done by a really bright medical student, uh, Ryan Ellis, who did a medical research scholars program with us last year. Why did we look at PDL1? Well, lymphocytic thyroiditis is very common in patients with thyroid cancer. In fact, it is thought to initiate papillary thyroid cancer, the link between inflammation and cancer. It occurs in about 30% of specimens that you look at in a patient that has had a thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid cancer. What's intriguing, though, is there's also an association that is disease-free survival. The patients that have lymphocytic infiltration, specifically of their tumor, tend to have lower risk of recurrent or persistent disease. Well, we were familiar with the work in PDL1 and PD1 in targeting it for immunotherapy for cancer. Uh, PDL1 is a ligand for PD1, which is expressed in T lymphocytes, and binding of these two inhibits T cell activation. And there had been studies that show that papillary thyroid cancer actually have activated T cells invading the cancer cell. So the first thing we did, or Ryan did, was look at our existing genome-wide expression data to look at whether PDL1 or PD1 expression was different. And you ask why? Well, there have been two studies in colorectal cancer and uh, breast cancer that showed that it might be a prognostic marker. So 
he did this, and in this panel you see this is a papillary thyroid cancer that was stained for the PDL1, and the cancer samples were positive. There were some samples that were also negative. And then he asked whether the positivity of PDL1 expression, this is the messenger RNA expression of the gene, was higher or lower based on whether there was lymphocytic infiltration of the cancer, as you could see on this H&E staining of a papillary thyroid cancer. And what he found was indeed the expression level for PDL1 was higher in those that had lymphocytic infiltration of their papillary thyroid cancer. And then he went on in a subset of the samples to demonstrate many of these are indeed T cell positive that were PDL1 positive. So there had been increasing work that shows that these oncogenic mutations could also function in tumor evasion. So the second thing we did was look at the relationship of PDL1 expression relative to whether the papillary thyroid cancer tumor sample was BRAF mutant versus negative. And as you can see on this figure, those that were BRAF positive had higher PDL1 levels than the papillary thyroid cancers that were not. BRAF positive. And we looked for the other activating mutations, the RAS, RET, PTC rearrangement, but there was really no association. The next thing to do is to really indirectly demonstrate whether this is a function of BRAF activation or not, that you have higher PDL1 levels. So we took four thyroid cancer cell lines and two of them, the 8505C and the SWU1736, have BRAF mutations, and then we used a compound that inhibits BRAF, and as you could see, you have in those that have BRAF activation, good inhibition of the phosphorylation of ERK, which is a downstream target compared to total ERK, but then as you could see in those mutant cell lines, when you use the Plexicon compound to inhibit BRAF, you have lower PDL1 expression than you do as compared to vehicle. And down here is just a densitometry level differences in the different mutants. So we found PDL1 to be upregulated in papillary thyroid cancer. Not surprisingly, it was higher in tumor samples with lymphocytic infiltration. And then lastly, it was higher in BRAF mutant positive samples, and likely due to activation of this pathway as when you inhibit it, you get lower levels of PDL1. So what? The whole idea in looking at this was to look at prognosis. And given that in other types of cancers, there had been an association with prognosis. So in uh, 98 patients with papillary thyroid cancer, which is a relatively small cohort, but with an adequate follow-up, a median follow-up of five years, we looked at this should be disease-free survival, and this is in months. And when you use the median as a cutoff, this is an independent sample than the initial uh, genome-wide expression analysis, you could tell that the patients with higher PDL1 level had a worse disease-free survival as compared to those with a lower level. So perhaps if you add this information to those tumor samples specifically that are BRAF mutant positive and then stratify those that have high PDL1 levels, you might be able to refine the subgroup of patients that are going to have more aggressive disease. This is just overall survival. As uh, you saw, even in 1,800 patients, it's difficult to demonstrate a survival difference, but there's actually, we found a statistical trend when you looked at overall survival. So we were excited with this data and we're trying to get a large enough cohort of patients that we could actually look at the presence of BRAF mutation and PDL1 expression and seeing if you could better stratify really those subgroups of patients that are going to have aggressive disease. So to go back to that patient, the 63-year-old woman with a family history, 
Her biopsy was atypia of undetermined significance, so we did the molecular testing. So for us at the NIH Clinical Center, and actually when I was in San Francisco at UCSF, this had become part of a ICD, a routine diagnostic test that you would request, is that you could request for BRAF mutation testing in the thyroid nodule biopsy sample. And since her risk was anywhere from 5 to 15 percent and she had a significant family history, we wanted to treat her appropriately in the initial treatment and not do a diagnostic procedure. And she ended up having a mutant positive tumor and we're planning on treating her aggressively, removing all of the thyroid gland and the lymph nodes and she probably will go on to get radioiodine therapy just uh, based on that information, both mutation positive and the family history. I'm going to finish off uh, with just summarizing what I shared with you. You know, the genetics and genomics data that's been generated over the last 10, 15 years has really gone into clinical practice. I think the somatic mutation analysis for the driver mutations is a very good way, if it's positive, to know it's cancer. The gene expression or gene profiling analysis tells us if it's benign, so there's clearly room for improvement, and I think the additional data that's being generated by the Cancer Genome Atlas might add to the accuracy of these markers. And then I think some of this information is also going to bring up important clinical questions that we never thought of. What is a thyroid nodule that's biopsied that is predicted to be benign? Natural history. We're using the genetics of it to say it's benign. And I shared with you at least the multi-step uh, hypothesis of thyroid cancer that most of us have accepted with progression from a follicular adenoma to follicular thyroid cancer. So I think that brings up an important clinical question that we really don't know the answer to uh, probably until 10 or 15 years down the road. And then lastly, I think it's not clear if it's cost effective. I understand some of the uh, commercial assays are in the thousands of dollars. But I think with the, the advances in technology and the next generation sequencing, that's probably going to be reduced where I think we'll deem it cost effective as it could alter the management of just avoiding an operation and hospital stay to doing it in one setting. And then it also might influence the type of adjuvant therapy that patients get. For example, a patient with a BRAF mutation, papillary thyroid cancer that's stage two, is more likely to get radioiodine ablation than not. I'm just going to finish up uh, with that and thank you for your attention and I look forward to any questions you have. Would you paraphrase the questions from the folks that don't have a mic? And I've got one way to offer it, and that is that it seems a, a subtitle to your talk is the refinement of pathologic diagnosis mm -hmm. using genomics. Are there constraints on the type of tissue you need to do the genomics? That is, can you do it on a, on a formaldehyde uh, fixed specimen? Or does it have to be freshly compensated? Yeah, so the uh, mutation analysis really could be done, could be done off of the cytology slides. And in fact, a couple of our patients, since there wasn't an extra biopsy sample, the pathologist retrieved it from the slide smear. So for the mutation analysis, that's probably adequate. For the gene expression classifier, there's, it's actually involved, you need uh, an additional biopsy of the thyroid nodule and there's a special media that's uh, used, at least the commercial assay that uh, is used for that. So, so you can't go to archive specimens to do the test? No. You cannot go to archive specimen. Uh -huh. What is the definition of gold standard when you're defining sensitivity and specificity in the indeterminate group? Because okay. you do not have anything to say. Is it a long-term follow-up after 10 years? Yes, so that, that's a terrific question, and you know, I've been involved in some of these study designs. So I, I think, sure, the question was, what is the gold standard for these indeterminate or inconclusive uh, biopsy results? 
So I think the, when you're establishing a, a new marker, the gold standard has to be histology, has to be the tumor being removed and the pathologist looking at it. Uh, once you have a sensitivity and specificity established based on that, in a relatively large number of patients, then I think you will have to accept the performance of that test in subsequent patients without having the gold standard diagnosis. So uh, both of the larger studies I shared with you did precisely that. So the molecular testing for the somatic mutation did that in over 900 thyroid uh, nodule cases. Uh, the gene expression classifier did that, but in a significantly less number of cases, 265. So probably not as rigorous as the uh, somatic mutation testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, a terrific question, and I think what uh, the surgeons deal in practice with, yeah, the advanced cancer, you know what to deal with. But most of the patients, 80% of the patients, are going to have subclinical papillary thyroid cancer or a thyroid nodule that's one centimeter. Look at all the big databases. You see how many thyroidectomies are being done. Yes. So, I, <laughs> no, I, I happen to agree with you. So, I think you will be happy to know that there was a meeting two weeks ago uh, of people across the country, surgeons, and there is a big push that we need to be judicious and maybe not over treating some of these one centimeter papillary thyroid cancer. So, believe it or not, there's uh, a proposal of active surveillance in those patients. There's wonderful Japanese data showing these patients don't progress and three to four percent actually regress. So, so that is where I think there would be very good application of it. And then I think the second application, at least surgically, that I could share with you is there is a big push to start doing lymph node dissection and that's not without morbidity to the patient. So my opinion is you really shouldn't do it, but if you're going to do it, do it in a BRAF positive tumor, not a BRAF negative. So I think those are two areas that the finer molecular analysis could probably alter the management, the surgical management of the, these patients. Thank you. Um, your, your comment about the research on the chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis being uh, something that puts you at increased risk of thyroid cancer fascinates me. Yeah. I'd like to take that one step further, and that is we're getting more and more patients that have euthyroid thyroid antibodies. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and we get it because they have autoimmune disease, they get it because the TSH has risen in the normal range. Um, and the question is, uh, what do we do with these people? A, does thyroid antibodies in any way predispose you to thyroiditis? And two, in your post-thyroiditis patients, what kind of Yeah, you know, so the data is both, some people think it's a finder bias. So a patient with autoimmune thyroid disease is going to get a neck exam, is going to get an ultrasound of the thyroid, you're going to check their antibodies. So some people think it's a finder bias, you're finding papillary. Uh, the other thought is, though, is the rate, as I shared with you, you know, 30% is pretty high. So I'm not really sure about the association. In regards to the antibody titer being positive, as you probably know, the chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis waxes and wanes. 
So it might be their antibody positive, and if you had the opportunity to remove their thyroid gland and look at it, that they're gonna have lymphocytic infiltration. They just don't have uh, the active disease at the time you're evaluating them is the way I would explain it. And then anything specific to do for those patients for their management, I'm not really sure if there is anything specific as it relates at least to the thyroid other than, you know, their obvious risk of hypothyroidism and needing replacement. I don't know if I'm answering the last question. Let's say you get a, a second thyroid biopsy years later, or would it pay to do BRAF on it or not? Or, um, it's That's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, you know, if it's going to be predisposed and is it going to be positive? I, I'm not aware of any study that looked at, has looked at that. But I think that's a fascinating question actually to pursue. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, ectopic uh, thyroid masses, specifically retrosternal endothoracic. Mm -hmm. Are they more prone to be malignant compared to the mass located in the neck? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, not to my knowledge, I think uh, in the 70s, Norm Thompson, wonderful endocrine surgeon from University of Michigan, uh, said substernal goiters have a high rate of follicular thyroid cancer, and any patient with substernal goiters should have a thyroidectomy for that reason. I, but I think the follow-up data, I think the risk of thyroid cancer, whether ectopic, substernal, is in a patient with a multinodular goiter is really similar. So I typically quote patients three to four percent of a dominant nodule in a multinodular goiter, whether substernal or ectopic. So I'm not aware of the rate being higher, but there is dated literature that suggests that it might be higher. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of physicians who do a lot of fluoroscopy, uh, an invasive cardiologist, they don't really protect their uh, neck as much as they should in terms mm -hmm. of scatter radiation. Should those physicians Yeah, you know, it's certainly a risk factor. I myself sometimes in the OR, you're using fluoro and you forgot to wear your thyroid shield. Um, it's an interesting question. I would say the first thing to do, the question was, you know, if you're radiation exposure field, should you get screening? Uh, I think a simple neck exam and a thyroid ultrasound, I it would probably be appropriate. I think you're more likely to find something incidentally of no consequence. Uh, genetically, could you screen out those who might be a higher risk? Yeah, so uh, those would have to be sort of germline genetic uh, syndromes. I'm not aware of any available testing that could predict the risk of thyroid cancer using blood uh, samples. Are there genomic reasons for the gender disparity between <laughs> Yes, we've, uh, the higher rates of thyroid cancer in women, and then when men get it, the mortality rate is higher, or it's more advanced disease in men. We've actually looked at uh, that, uh, and at least their genomic profile of the tumor seems to be different. And uh, as you could imagine, that's a complicated study. You know, what time do you obtain a tumor sample from a, a woman? Is it uh, during menses? So, Overall, there's a difference. So what we did to answer that question, whether there's really a gender difference, is we used a transgenic uh, mouse model of thyroid cancer and removed the ovaries from the female mice. And in half of the mice, we did a sham surgery. And then we did a similar thing in the male mice, removed the testicles, did a sham surgery. And what was surprising to us is, by virtue of removing the ovaries, mind you, this is a transgenic model of uh, follicular thyroid cancer due to a thyroid hormone receptor beta inactivation. In the female mice, if they didn't have ovaries, their rate of developing thyroid cancer was lower. And in men, they had less, or the male mice, they had less aggressive, less larger thyroid cancers if their testes were removed. So it suggests there's some effect of the sex hormone, but specifically what is unclear. And the hypothesis about the high mortality rate in men is men don't go to doctors. Yes, that's uh, a common. <laughs> Are there other comments or questions? 
Thank you so much.